ready to go. So tonight, ooh, I might kill that reverb. Um, so tonight's title is The Serpent and the Soul. And I'm not going to do much of a preamble tonight. There's going to be a lot of, like, history. Um, I'll try and spice it up, you know. I, I remember having a history teacher, which was bomb. Um, and then there were other teacher, history teachers that were not quite that compelling. So, see what I can do here for you tonight. But again, the title, The Serpent and the Soul. <laughs> so, we are going to be looking at the bronze serpent in the wilderness night. The bronze serpent um, on the rod... Uh, the Moses raises up for the people. You know, you know the story. Very common story. <clears throat> uh, so that that serpent and the rod. I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, that is like a, a typical, a common symbol um, across cultures, generations, um, and, and going back in ancestors and whatnot. Um, that symbol is is commonly um, associated with. Healthcare or um, healthcare or medicine. So you, you'd see it on like an ambulance. Uh, a lot of ambulances have it on their side. It's that little. Uh, I think it's usually a blue. It's like a blue asterisk with the little rod and the snakes going around it. Um, so that's the image. That's the imagery. Or you could, if you know what I'm talking exactly about, um, how Moses raises that rod up with the serpent. Uh, but it is uh, just talking about history, uh, the culture that it's most commonly known for uh, is in Greek mythology. It's called the Rod of Asclepius. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but the Rod of Asclepius. And that's not something that you really need to know, but that's just commonly associated with. But, as I said, that symbol has been around for ages. So the exact origin is unknown, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was due to the Israelite experience um, a, as far as being the origin. So what led to the bronze serpent? So we're going to go and we're going to look at Numbers 21 verses 4 to 8. Numbers 21 verses 4 to 8, and that's going to be the main scripture tonight. That's the scripture tonight, Numbers 21 verses 4 to 8. So, verse 4 says, Then they journeyed, this is the Israelites, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So there's a lot going on in there. There's a lot. So let's look at a few things here. The fact, so the first, the verse 4, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. So this verse is following, right before that, they had just come out of war. They, have just, they had just come out of war at that point <clears throat> against the Canaanites. And so, as you can imagine... Coming out of war, you're a little bit tired. And, well, actually, this is, a, this is a little side road. One thing about the Israelites' wilderness experience um, and their conquests and all the wars that they got into, they were not, they didn't have um, all the, let's say, weapons, the, the, the f fancy weapons that all the other territories had. Um, so that, uh, 
what the Canaanites, um, the oh goodness, I can't remember the others. <laughs> yeah, all the other ites, really. Um, they didn't have the weapons that they did, partly because they had just come out of Egypt on, uh, of slavery, so they didn't, they didn't have it for that reason. And because of their slavery um, and being suppressed and subdued, they didn't really know metallurgy, or, or they didn't understand metal or, or have the means of working with metal to forge weapons of their own. So when they went to battle... You know, uh, pretty often you would hear that they destroyed everything when they would go to a place. They, they, they wouldn't, some, some of the time they wouldn't take anything. They would just destroy everything and leave. <clears throat> so part of that is that, uh, of course, what God was telling them to do, but otherwise, some of the things they couldn't use. So let's just say, as far as war is concerned, they didn't have the best equipment and they would defeat a nation. Uh, and they would, you would think, I would think, oh, they'd pick up the weapons, the, the swords, and take them and use them afterwards. But, you know, after war, uh, actually, goodness, I mean, my little, my little blade here, this thing is already dull. It's been, I've used it for a week and it's dull. So after a war, as you can imagine, a knife needs to be sharpened or a sword needs to be sharpened. They didn't have the means to sharpen, um, and they didn't really know how either. So often they relied on farm equipment, uh, you know, a, a scythe, a sickle, um, jawbones, um, you know that story, various other things that, that were available to them. And that was so amazing to me to learn because it showed that even, when, even if when dealt an inferior hand, you know, even if God deals you in fear your hand at some point, at some times in life, you feel like you've gotten the bad hand. God is going to use that for his glory to bring to bring a victory to you, even with inferior equipment. See, as a result of inferior weapons, they had to rely on God to bring victory in battle. They had to rely on God. <clears throat> And often, it's, I'm, I'm not going to mention too many, but they would rely on trickery. It was, okay, either God, the, the, the warrior God, coming in and, and into battle and giving them a victory, or they would de depend on wisdom from God, the wisdom in how to defeat a certain enemy. So one of the things, you know, I, I, can't, I don't remember exactly uh, who it was right now, but they went into the camp at night, and they surrounded the camp, and they made a big ruckus. They started breaking pitchers and making a ruckus, and they woke up the enemy, their enemy, and the enemy was like in a kerfuffle. They were all confused, and they started battling each other. You know, you know that story. Yeah, and so, again, it was things like that that the Israelites de relied on. They relied on God to provide a way for them to win the battle for them. <clears throat> so, they had just got done going to war. They were done warring. And, well, as you can imagine, after warring, I would, like, be open to open a bottle of cola or something like that, put a, putting my feet up. I'm like, okay, I just, we just had a victory. I want to relax. Now is my time to relax. Um, not quite. That's not how it works. <clears throat> Um, even me, myself, after preaching on Wednesday nights, actually, or, you know, on a Sunday, after preaching or, you know, those of you who have gone to war, no, I have not, but even preaching, you know, when I get done, like tonight or, or on a Sunday, when I finish, I just want to relax. Usually, Wednesday nights is when I just go home and snack hard. It's like, oh, I finished preaching. I'm just going to go snack now. The <laughs> goodness, I have a <laughs> like everybody knows that. But that's the problem, though. Too often on the heels of a victory, we let our guard down. Too often on the heels of a victory, we let our guard down. And. We know the devil is just waiting for that moment. He's, he's like a, uh, man, 
man, my, my brain ain't working tonight too well. But, no, it's not that one, but uh, he is just, he's waiting for any, any opportunity, any door we open, or, or that little mo- those little moments of rest. Thank you. Amen to that. See, the enemy, that's when the enemy will creep in and make us think that, no, I deserve those treats. I deserve that bottle of cola. I deserve a rest. I sit on the couch. I, I deserve to just chill out right now. Now, that brings us to the second thing. They were dependent on God for their food and water, the most basic necessity of life, food and water. And so when I was going through this, I was trying to put myself in their shoes, trying to think it out truly. So think of that, I'm, I think most of us in Western culture over here don't understand that idea of, ha- of not knowing when the next meal or, or, or when water is, a- is going to be available to us. Most of us don't have that issue. And so to think that having to depend on God to bring water out of rocks or, or, or manna, any of those things, waiting for God to provide the basic necessities for life. You know, that's like the story that, that pastor shares uh, of, of, a, of a kid um, drown or uh, a father and son and the father trying to teach his kid by, by you know, putting his underwater, head underwater a few times that you need to want God more than you want your, that next breath. And so it really made me think of that, that God, I am needing you to provide this need, the, the, this essential need for me. So I need God because I need to live. It's like breath for us. I mean, that is essentially it. God, I'm needing you to be my life because without you, I'm dead. I got nothing. <clears throat> But it would teach you, it would teach me, like, the, the truest trust in our provider. I mean, honestly, if I went through that, it would teach me for a period of time until I forgot and started doing my own dumb ways, you know, like we all do. We forget. In Numbers 21, verse 16, it says, gather people together and I will give them water. Now, I already mentioned the, the, a couple times of how God would provide for them, but that's what it says. Gather the people together, and I will give them water. You know, a, f- a couple years ago, a couple years ago, I was uh, I went backpacking with a friend. It was just me and him, and it was over there near Fresno, and it was uh, like real backpacking. It was just out in the in the wilderness. And we would have to filter the wa- filter our water. So we would go to the stream and, you know, put that little coil, whatever, in there. And we'd pump the water, and then it would filter, and then we had our water for the day. And we would put it, you know, we would fill up those little jugs, those big water bottles, and that was water for the day, as I said. And so one day, it was near the end of the day, and my friend went down to the stream. Because, I mean, it's not too often you find a perfect spot, like a perfect place to pitch camp right next to the stream, you know? So we were, you know, a little ways away from from the little river that was there. And so my friend was like, hey, I'm going to go get water. Uh, And I was like, yeah, I'm I'm good. I'm good to go. I got enough. And no, that was actually the morning. That was in the morning. I was like, no, I, I've got enough water for the day. And so I don't get water. And we end up going, and my friend is a little more adventurous, a little more, maybe only slightly more active than me. And so he had been used to this. And so we went on this big trek and, and things that I was not comfortable doing, you know, walking on little cliffs. Actually, I say cliffs. It was not a cliff, really. It just sounds very dramatic. But... um. We, so it was just this long trek, and I was getting beaten. And I get to the point where I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, I don't know when, the ne- when, this ne- when my next source of water is, is going to come up. And I didn't have that much. I was like, great, now i got to start um, 
I have to start saving this water. And so I was just taking these tiny little sips as we went, and it was a warm day. It was a hot day. <clears throat> and by the end of the day, we pitched camp, and I remember I was, I was sick. I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sick. I'm going to throw up. Um, and I felt like, like there was some heat exhaustion going on. Um, and then I realized, my goodness, I, I, I needed to get water. I should not have done that dumb thing and not gotten water that morning. And so I had to go down and get water. And that's when it hit me. It's, I can't rely on yesterday's well of water to sustain me the next day. I can't rely on yesterday's, the presence of God yesterday to, to sustain me today. I can't rely on, rely on Sunday's message to get me through the week or Wednesday's message to get me through the week. No, it's good for that day. And yes, dig into it. Learn from it. Continue digging. That's what's, that's what's going to sustain you. Continuing to dig for that well, that, that, that water, that, the Holy Spirit, God's presence. Continuing to dig every single day because we know that it's not good afterwards. You, you can't rely on the past, on the past blessings of God, of God to sustain you. He's our provider, and he will provide every day. We saw that with the Israelites. He will provide. He will provide. Third, they were taking the scenic route. So next up, they were taking the scenic route. So, I mean, as you've heard, this was the wilderness experience. Uh, interestingly enough, I... I heard this recently, uh, and actually, I mean, it's in Scripture, but God didn't, the whole idea of God taking the Israelites into the promised land wasn't the fact, I'm taking you out of Egypt to get you into the promised land. You know, multiple times it says, I am taking you out of Egypt to worship me in the wilderness. The wilderness was purposeful. There was a point to it. There was a point to it. And that point was to learn to trust God. The point was to learn to trust that he would provide for us, even when we don't see it, when, even when it's difficult, when we know, okay, I could get my own, I could get my own water, I could get my own wife, I could get my, I could get my own, the, the best job, I know exactly what's best for me, and I could get those things myself. God is our provider. Do what you can, of course, but... Let God sway you. Let God direct your path. <clears throat> so they were taking the scenic route. Edom, the land of Edom, they wouldn't allow them, allow them to cross through their land. And so they had to go around, making it an even longer trek. Um, and so the whole wilderness experience, you know, they were walking for days, years, um, and so they, it was a ton of walking, and it's like, you know, when you could have taken a, a shortcut, when you can, isn't that the worst, when you can see where you need to get to, but there's a like, oh man, if only this wasn't there, I would be there in five minutes, not 25 minutes. <clears throat> so that's what it was. They had this long route that they had to walk now because this, this country wouldn't let them go through. So verse 5 the people spoke against God, verse 5 and 6, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Fiery serpents, for one, that means venomous snakes, because that's what the, when, when they got bit, that's what it would feel like to them, burning, uh, burning sensation. So that's what that means, venomous snakes. Poisonous snakes biting them. <clears throat> um, and that is actually kind of terrifying. If you, if, when I actually thought about it, you know, they didn't have these commercial roads that we have or these, you know, uh, these park rangers and going and taking little shovels and making trails for us out, and making trails for them. No, there, there may have been some, there was trails, of course, back then. But much of it, you know, especially in a wilderness experience, <laughs> they were going through the wilderness. I'm sure they were going through brush, forest, um, well, maybe not forest, 
but they were going through wilderness, and so there wasn't always trails available to them. And snakes, was a con that was a common thing back then. And when I thought of that, I mean, how many of you have either gone snake hunting or simply walked through, you know, brush out here in the countryside in, in, in the hot summer? See, I, I, people have. I mean, I, I have, you know, at, at, my, at home, on the property. I remember one years ago, me and, me and a friend, we took shotguns. We were like, I don't remember if we were set out to find a rattlesnake or what, or if we were shooting squirrels, but I don't, can't imagine doing that with a shotgun. Um, but we went out, and we were, me and him, we split up, and all I heard, like, you know, t a couple minutes later, he was over there, I was over here. All I heard was, ah, like, like a scream and then a shot. I was like, oh, I think he found something. <clears throat> and, like, when you're, when you're walking through a brush, uh, actually, thank God that we live where we do, and the snakes make noise here. The venomous snakes make noise. I mean, have you ever looked at the snakes over there uh, as far as um, Asia and Africa and Australia, too? Seriously, they got gnarly snakes. You know, I thought the rattlesnake was bad. I knew there was worse, but I started looking into these snakes, and there's some hardcore snakes. Like, oh, you get bit by this snake. Oh, we got anti-venom. Oh, guess what? That doesn't help you. You're dead anyways. <clears throat> Serious. It's crazy. So, like, imagining walking through that and just knowing that at any moment, a snake that could just be just in this brush could come out and strike you. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of wild. <laughs> Literally. <clears throat> so, therefore the people came to Moses, verse 7, and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So in looking into this, I was very curious, why the serpent? Of all the things, why the snake? Why did God have Moses, why did he choose a snake to put on the pole? <laughs> and so there was a few things that crossed my mind or that I had heard from, you know, reading or listening uh, maybe it was because uh, snakes were a sign of newness of life. You know, the, a snake sheds its skin, and then it's kind of renewed. And so throughout history, th that's one um, representation as far as newness of life with snakes goes. So maybe it was that. <clears throat> uh, maybe it was to eliminate their fear of the snakes, putting a snake on a rod, to eliminate the fear of snakes. So I had heard that um, from a psychologist. A psychologist talked about this. And he taught, I mean, as you can imagine, a psychologist, they're going to come up with this conclusion, I, I would suppose. And so this, this person mentioned, OK, maybe it was because they dealt with all these snakes and they were fearful of these snakes. And so why not, of course, put up a snake that you would look at to stop you to, to destroy that fear, basically. You know, the, the whole idea of putting yourself um, in front of those things that you fear so that you don't fear them anymore, uh, phobias. So that person brought that up. I was like, okay, maybe. <clears throat> maybe it was more obvious than that, though. See, the Israelites started complaining, so God sends snakes. But it's not like they started complaining, and then after that, after, you know, it's not like they complained, and then God said with a loud, booming voice from heaven, he's like, oh, you started complaining, I'm sending snakes, and they're going to bite you, and you're going to die. That didn't happen. 
that doesn't, I mean, it'd be nice if it did, right? If, if God would, would, would come down with a loud, booming voice and say, don't do this, or you just messed up. Consequences are going to follow. It wouldn't be nice. Fortunately, we got the Holy Spirit to do that for us. Thank God. Hopefully, it's actually be- beforehand say, saying, don't do that, instead of, oh, you just did that. Hopefully, you listen <laughs> enough to say, okay, God, I'm not going to do that. So, the Israelites may have thought that they had just wandered into a snake den or, or snake territory, and hence more, complaining ensued, not realizing it was God's judgment on them. I mean, it's kind of, it, I mean, that's what we would do. It's, it's likely what, what, that's my thinking, and that's likely what I think would have happened. So, not realizing it was God's judgment on them, so they bring this up to Moses, and Moses, on behalf of God, or Moses has this snake rod made. Could they have then put it together, the Israelites, could they have put it together now when looking up at this rod, and the, the serpent on a rod? Could they have realized that when they were looking at this rod for healing, physical healing from God, that all these snake bites and death were a direct consequence of their sin. And it would seem so, it would seem so, as the bronze aspect of the serpent was also not an accident. The fact that it was a bronze serpent, it could have been something else, uh, although bronze was more common back then, um, it was the least, you know, the least of the th- of of gold and silver and brass or bronze, um, the cheaper the cheaper of them. But he said to make it out of a uh, a bronze serpent, a bronze one. See, bronze represents God's judgment or humanity, God's judgment or humanity. <laughs> if you look at the tabernacle, the bronze laver and the altar. Uh, They were used to atone and clean oneself of their sin. And once finished, that person could then enter the presence of God. So this, as you can imagine, could have been a very humbling experience. Looking up at that rod and being so humbled that, oh my goodness, this, this is God talking to us. Seeing all that we had done, and we are realizing our sin, but I thank you, God, that you are still healing us and being our provider, even though we just complained, we just said, we just started talking amongst ourselves that it would have been better in Egypt to die in, under ense- enslavement rather than to come out here and worship you, th- than to come out here and find who our God is, who our provider is, who our creator is. <clears throat> that could have been a very humbling also rewarding experience. And the fact that God is still there. He's like, you just messed up, but I am still here, and I still want to heal you. I still want to bring you healing. You are still my people. You are still my children. I am still your provider. See, John 3, 14 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent to the wi- in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus was lifted up on the cross, and we looked on him as he took on our death so that we might live. It was the same thing with the bronze serpent. It was, that, it was the same idea, the same idea that we... That the Israelites would have looked at that bronze serpent and the death that they were about to uh, 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 experience was transferred onto that snake and they were given a new life. <clears throat> they were given life instead. And they must have believed it as well. They must have truly believed that looking at this rod was going to bring healing to them, physical healing. So, so many people know, you know, <laughs> plenty of people around here, around the world know, oh, 
I know that Jesus died, or I've heard that he died and rose, but you got to truly believe it. You have to believe it in your heart. If you want that eternal life, you got to truly believe it in your heart. You have to believe it. And so these people must have had to believe. When Moses said, okay, this is what's going to happen, they had to have faith that they were going to get healed, that they were going to live again. See, when we're looking at Jesus, it's easy enough to believe him that he took our spiritual death. But can we believe him that he took our physical death? As in, can he heal, can he heal me? Can God still heal me? Can he still provide for me? You know, again, it's easy to say, okay, I'm getting to heaven. But can I truly believe that I can bring heaven down on earth today, tomorrow? That God is going to be working on my behalf today. That he is going to show up when I need him to. When I ain't got the bills or when I, get the, when I don't have the money to pay the bills. That he is going to show up at the last second. You know, can I believe that he took my vice so that I wouldn't have that, that you know, sin is death. Sin is death. So can I believe that he took not only, you know, my, my, he took my spiritual death and took it upon himself, but can I believe that he took my vices, my sin, and, and took it on the cross and that I wouldn't have to deal with those things? And I could give those things up. So later on, we see in 2 Kings 18, verse 4, 2 Kings 18, verse 4, He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. I think this is why Jesus performed miracles so differently. He didn't want us to think there was some sort of formula for getting results. <clears throat> uh, there wasn't some sort of special process. The power was in God. You know, the power was in God. And we deal with idols still this day. I mean, even, <laughs> I mean, all of us have our things. I don't get sick too often. Maybe sometimes, maybe I feel more sick more than often, but I don't actually get sick, you know, like the cold or flu that often, I don't think. Um, but when I do, but when I do, I don't, I'm not a pill popper. I don't like, you know, Tylenol, any of those things. Nah, if I got a headache, I'm just going to power through or whatever. But cold or flu or something happens, hook me up with that NyQuil. I am all about that NyQuil life. That stuff is going to knock me out, and I'm going to sleep through the night, and I'm going to feel better in the morning. But if you're at, well, actually, no, this only applies to the men. I was going to say, if you're at the men's night, obviously only the men were at men's night. Um, but Dave Bowler talked about this. You know, he was saying he, he could trust God. David Bullard, you know, I mean, his testimony and the things that God does in his life was amazing is amazing and he was saying that you know since childhood and up, and up to these days up to this day you know god provides supernatural healing for him and he's learned i think for a long time now he's learned that he doesn't go to the doctor he doesn't go to some sort of medicine first he goes to god first he goes to god first when he's feeling sick or feeling whatever or, or dealing with some sort of gash or or cut he goes to God first. So I was, I was thinking of that. I was just trying to think of idols in my life. You know, what are the things that I rely on? What are the things I look to for healing? What are, what are the things I look to, to to provide for me? You know, my job, I think I have so much reliance on my job that could dry up in an instant. But yeah, so NyQuil came up for me. And all of us have our things, you know. But 
God is our provider. God is our healer. God is our reliance. God is our source. God is our source. And now part two of this, I'm not going to get into the second part. I'm going to save that for sometime soon, I imagine. But tonight I just wanted to focus, <laughs> oh goodness, tonight I, I was going to focus on the serpent. That sounds so bad. Which is still brings up the point, you know, why did God choose the serpent? But maybe I answered it for myself anyways. But as I said, the title is The Serpent and the Soul. The serpent and the soul. So we looked at what the bronze serpent was and what it did for the Israelites and what it represented and the idol that it became because people trusted in this thing rather than trusting in the power of God. <clears throat> but now, next we're going to look at the soul. You know, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and, it is, as a, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the soul. If you look at verse 5 of what I was, you know, Numbers 21 verse 5, you know, the people started complaining why have we brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food or water. And our soul loathes this worthless bread. Our soul loathes this worthless bread. So next time, I'm going to get into the soul part of it and the whole idea of decision and the seat of the soul, what that means. You know, pastor always has the thing up or not always he's got his whole idea of the spirit soul body so that's what we're going to talk about next time <sighs> but for now i'm going to close up right now we got out of here early so you can go get some ice cream thank you god Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you, God, that you are our provider. You were our provider back then. You are pro our provider today. You are provi our, our provider tomorrow, God. You don't stop, Lord. You, you, <laughs> unless, we, unless we break that covenant, Lord. But, God, we are in covenant with you, Lord. We are in covenant with you, and you are our provider. We must trust you, God. So I thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you have already provided for us, Lord, who you are to us, oh God. Again, thank you for money, Lord, that you give us, you give it to us as a tool, God. As a tool, not an idol, but a tool, God. I thank you for jobs, Lord. I thank you for jobs. I thank you for family, for friends, for children. You know, the, the, the good things books, whatever it may be, Lord, just the, the, the normal stuff, the times of relaxation, being able to relax. Lord, I thank you, God, that you are still the source, God, and that we don't place anything above you, Lord. Thank you, God. I ask if we could have a little worship right now, just before we leave. <clears throat> 